listen to a series of uh, from a come uh, of a comedy science fiction book, and uh, they said. Um, these aliens invaded and they were going to blow up the earth and there's this kind of neurotic guy and he says at times like this I wish I would have listened to what my mother told me all those times and his friend said why what'd she say he said I don't know I didn't listen <laughs> I met a lot of people who that describes their relationship with Jesus when disaster happens then they start saying oh Lord I I want to hear you I want to know your will <laughs> but why not walk with Jesus through the good times and celebrate? Amen. You ever have a friend who only, you only hear from him when he needs something from yeah. you? Yeah, you get tired of hearing him call, right? You know they're going to ask you for money or to borrow your car or sleep on your couch or something. Yeah. How awesome is it when friends call you just because they missed you and they want to hang out? Right. Yeah, yeah. How much more so with Jesus? And uh, we are always blessed um, when we choose to hang out with him, when we choose to worship him. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we look to your word today, Lord, we want to come before you now before disaster hits. Lord, we want to walk closely with you so we know your heart. So that, Lord, we instinctively know if we should turn to the left or the right because your Holy Spirit is guiding us. Lord, we want to walk with you. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speaking your words of love to us yet again. And so, Lord, we invite you to do just that. Lord, you are the way and the truth and the life. And so, Lord, we just want to follow you, believe your words, and enjoy life with you. Bless us, Lord, as we look to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we've been going through the statements that Jesus said in the Gospel of John that begin with the phrase, I am. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the bread of life. I am the gateway. And today we are looking at, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. It's from the Gospel of John chapter 15. And um, these words might be familiar to you. And um, I don't know if you ever think, I'm just not as clever and insightful as Pastor Kevin. Well, that's really sad because I'm not that clever and insightful. But you know what I do? Yes, you I read something and I ask God, Lord, what is up with that? And then I listen. And so <laughs> there's one of my very holy prayers that you can mimic. I, I keep mentioning I need to write Pastor Kevin's bad book of prayers. And, and, uh, yeah, I want the first copy. I better hurry up and start doing that. Because it's stunning. Sometimes I think God just cracks up like when toddlers talk to you. And, you know, when I pray something like that, God's like, here you go. You're so cute. <laughs> well, many of Jesus' commands seem counterintuitive. He tells you to do something, you know, like love your enemies. And it's like, oh, so I'm calling to be a doormat, you know. Or, or you're worried, you know, in your weakness, that's when God comes to strongest. And it's like, well, good for you, God, but I'll be dead by then. <laughs> and, and it's counterintuitive if God is not a part of the picture. And that's why it's called faith. When God commands us to do something, it's because it doesn't come natural. When Joshua became leader of the Israelites, several times God told him, be strong and courageous. You know why God said that? Because he felt weak and he was terrified. That's why. If he was already strong and courageous, God wouldn't say, I just keep doing it, you know. So when Jesus commands us to do something, it's often the opposite of what we feel like we need to do. And yet, he is the author of life. He is the one who breathed life into us. He is the one who created our world. He knows the best way to function. Kind of like, you know, if somehow you catch fire... You know what we intuitively do? We run, which fans the flames and helps us burn faster. <laughs> but really what we're told to do is, you know, if you remember it in school, stop, drop, and roll. You know, drop to the ground. So sometimes if somebody catches fire, the way you help them is chase them down and tackle them because they're running. And it, it's counterintuitive, but um, like we can outrun fire when it's our clothing that's burning. You don't think straight when, when something like that happens. So Jesus gives us certain commands, 
And it's not on you to judge if he knows what he's talking about. Which is what most people do. But what he calls you to do is trust me. When he said believe in me, he didn't mean believe I exist. He means believe I know what I'm talking about. And believe that what I said I will do, I will do. So when Jesus gives certain commands, they sound like you will achieve the opposite of what he's promised. Well, let me ask you this. Would you like more joy in your life? I, sometimes you'd be like, well, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus, so I'm supposed to be happy. Be happy. Be happy. You know, your mom ever tell you that? Yeah. That's actually a line out of one of our favorite movies. This family's on vacation. And the mother, this is a very happy time. <laughs> yeah, she's scolding them, and it's like, yeah, God doesn't do that. God fills you with joy so that no matter what craziness in the world is going around you, you know it's going to be good. Would you like more joy in your life? Because that's a lot of what Jesus' point is about John 15. Jesus tells us how, how to do that, how to get more joy in our life. But at first it might seem like a lot of work. Actually, the work is being double-minded. Doing what Jesus said, believing in your whole heart is not going to work. <laughs> right? That's why we call it having faith in Jesus. Either what he said is true, or you write him off as an idiot like Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, here's the first eight verses. He said this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Yes. There's just a lot of rich, richness in that. We have the joy of living near vineyards. You ever go by, you're driving out in the countryside and there's a vineyard, and right about now, they've been pruning it, they've been trimming and if you don't know anything about grapevines, you drive by and you're like, how are any grapes going to grow on that? Look at that. They've cut it all the way back. Well, yeah, that way what does grow out, all that energy can go towards growing grapes instead of keeping all the sticks alive that are sticking around everywhere like wild. And God doesn't say, I will cut you off and throw you in the fire. He says, if you don't remain in me, that's about how useful you are. Like something dead laying around that's just waiting to be burned. There are descriptions here of what God does, what Jesus does, and what we are to do. And what he is doing is, he's describing our relationship with him. I don't know how many of you, you read your Bible and you're like, it's the chore list your mom left for you on Saturday morning. Okay. I have to do this, I have to do that, that way she won't blow up on me when she gets home. I have to do this, I have to do that, that way God doesn't blow up at me when I go home. You know? <laughs> no, that's not it at all. We are in a love relationship with Jesus. He wants what's best for us and what will bring us joy. So he's describing our relationship to him and the implications of that. So there's a couple of things that he tells us to do. First, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. Remain in Christ. Now, it must be vitally important because he then warns us in verses 4 and 5, which is the second thing, 
You can't bear fruit unless you remain in me, and apart from me, you can do nothing. You ever seen talented people that did a lot and it amounted to nothing? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've known people, they got college degrees that when they graduated, they realized they were useless because of what they studied. Or some people might devote themselves to uh, a certain trade that no longer exists. Apart from him, yeah, you may look like you're working hard, but what you're accomplishing is nothing. But when you remain in Christ, a lot just happens. Matter of fact, there are days where I'm just flat out embarrassed before God. Because I feel like I gave God two ounces and he made a mountain out of it. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, Lord. I, one of my best friends always credits me with leading him to Jesus. And I, I'm so embarrassed whenever he says that. I, I just invited him to our youth group because we needed a trumpet player. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my, really? my best friend Kevin invited me to church and I heard the gospel and gave my life to Jesus. I'm like, oh. We just needed a trumpet player in our musical. <laughs> you know? So it's like, get God an inch, he'll take a mile in a good way. So Jesus' goal for you is to be with him, not someday when you die, but right here, right now. That is Jesus' goal for you. A lot of people get that wrong. They think somehow they got to work really hard to impress God. Like, oh, okay, I'll let you into the club. No, he just wants to be close to you. Matter of fact, Scripture describes our relationship to Jesus like a marriage. When you do that and you start listening to how some Christians talk, it's a creepy kind of marriage for them, right? You ever heard somebody say, I just want to be used by God? Okay, let's apply that to marriage. <laughs> Imagine a wife saying, I just want to be used by my husband. Yeah, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> or... Uh, or the husband, yeah, I just want to be used by my wife. It's like, really? That's usually a complaint. I feel like I'm just being used. What would you think if someone described their marriage that way? We don't want to describe our faith like that, faith life like that. Actually, there's a great verse in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3, that describes how our relationship with Jesus should be. I am my beloved's and he is mine. That is how, how our relationship should be described. Or as Jesus put it, remain in me and I will remain in you. And then he says that basically the byproduct of that is going to be bearing fruit. And we're going we're gonna to look in a minute at what this whole bearing fruit thing is. Because again, growing up, I just thought, ah, that's it. That's where the chore list comes in, right? No. But you've got to understand that because of your relationship with Jesus... Any good thing that is going to flow from you comes from your relationship with Jesus. Because apart from him, it produces nothing. You ever been somewhere and you realize nothing good was coming from that? And then here's one of Pastor Kevin's great holy prayers. Well, Lord, I've kind of blown this day, but i got ten more minutes if you want to do something. I've seen God do amazing things in the next 10 minutes after I finally got my act together and asked and invited God and decided, okay, Lord, my uh, 55 minutes amounted to nothing. Five minutes left, what do you got? I, I was driving south on Pacific Avenue past Delta College one day, and I'm like, well, Lord, this day has been a blast, but I got 15 minutes before I got to pick up the kids from school. So got anything you want me to do in 15 minutes? And I glance over and I see a girl sitting on the bus stop bench that used to come here 10 years before. I'm like, oh, okay, Lord. So I pull into Target's parking lot, walk up, sit back. Ah, she screams, catch up with life. Talk about, no, it's okay. God still loves you. And, and got her reconnected with the church. And, and then I get back in the car and I'm just embarrassed. Okay, Lord. It would have been nice to have a whole hour of this kind of stuff. Sorry I didn't come to you before, you know. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But with him, we bear much fruit. So the third, that is the third thing that he states. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. There's nothing there about you trying, right? There's nothing there saying you will try really hard and I will bless your efforts. No, we hang out with Jesus and watch his efforts flow. So what does Jesus mean by bearing fruit? Some people think it means you'll convince a lot of people to follow Jesus. You'll get a lot of converts. 
Some, unfortunately, a lot of church people, that is the only focus of their life. Sorry you're starving and your father's abusing you, but give your life to Jesus so I can move on to the next person. <laughs> and, and they don't actually help the people. Some people think it just means holy chores. And if you're already tired and if you're discouraged, you don't want more holy tasks because you're already fried. Or maybe you think, uh, if I just remain in Jesus enough, I'll see God do miracles. And I don't see miracles happening, so I must not be good enough. I must not be remaining in Jesus the way he taught. There's all these misconceptions about what he means by bearing fruit, but it, it's always good to use scripture to interpret scripture. So when you talk about bearing fruit, you can start to easily understand what Jesus is talking about if you say, well... If it's fruit of the Spirit, what is he talking about? Maybe the fruit of the Spirit, right? From Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let me ask you, is the world starving for this right about now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And yet you have the fruit tree. You have the fruit if you remain in Christ this is the fruit you will bear. You ever tried really hard to be joyful when you weren't? You really tried to have peace when you're stressed? Okay, you ever planted a tree and sat there and smacked it trying to get it to grow fruit? No, you just plant it, you water it, and God makes it happen, right? That's how fruit comes. You plant yourself in Jesus so you are in Christ, and the fruit is just going to happen. It's going to flow from the very nature of your relationship with Him. Let me give you two observations about you bearing the fruit of the Spirit so that what is here can flow out of you. First of all, they are not your goals. They are a byproduct that flows from who you are. I've, I've heard people, they, you know, every now and then we, we try to get people to read through the Bible every day. And it's interesting because when you read through the Bible every day, there are a lot of days that you don't just hit the happy thought for the day that makes everything smooth. However, I've had people tell me, you know what? I don't yell at other drivers anymore while I drive. And it wasn't a conscious decision. It's just daily time in God's Word is transforming my heart. And uh, I know Joyce has told people before, in the old days, I would have whooped your butt right about now, but I don't do that anymore because I got Jesus in me. And she just didn't decide, thou shalt not butt whip. <laughs> but, <laughs> but God has just transformed her heart. And a whole bunch of you are very vocal about how God has transformed your heart. And it wasn't because you set a goal and decided, I have to be nice now, so I'm going to start doing this and I'm going to stop doing that. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It's growing out of who you are. And according to 1 Corinthians 13, you might try to do great things for God, but if you don't have love, not only does it amount to nothing, but often it's annoying. But the fruit of the Spirit fills you with the love of God, and it animates what you do in a much different way. In other words, apart from Him, you can do nothing. When you dwell in Him, in Christ, or remain in Him, hanging out with Him, the fruit of the Spirit flows from you. You ever have other people ask you how you can possibly treat an annoying person like you actually like them? <laughs> Ignore. <No>. Well, <laughs> some people are like, I can't stand that guy. I don't know how you can talk to him. And, well, there's an opportunity. Let me tell you about Jesus, because, you know, so, they are not goals, but a byproduct that flows from who you are. Uh, a second thing about the fruit of the Spirit is this. You cannot bear the fruit of the Spirit by yourself and in isolation. You can't be patient with anybody if you're never around anybody. Some, some of you are like, yeah, that's how I do it. <laughs> yeah, and then those social media. But by its very nature, it requires that you interact with other people. You can't bear the fruit of the Spirit without ever having contact with anybody else. How can you express love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control if you don't have any contact with anyone. I told somebody once, somebody said, man, I don't know why that guy just hates me. It's like he has it out for me. I don't understand it. I said, oh, you need to thank God for that. Like, why? I said, how else can you know the joy of obeying Jesus' command, love your enemies, if you don't have any enemies? He's like, does that even work? I'm like, hey, it's his word. Toss it back up to him. See what he does with it. I mean, can you really boast about how kind and patient you are with your coworkers if you work by yourself? <laughs> that's, that, that's not really... You can't understand the joy of what God does through you if you're not around anybody. And this kind of takes us back to our original question. How can you remain in Christ? How can you remain in Christ? And so I was, I was looking at a couple of, of possibilities out of Scripture. Again, in verses 4 and 5 of John 15, he says, Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, a lot of church people just default. He's saying, I need to pray more and read my Bible more. I already do that 15 hours a week. I can't take much more. <laughs> no, it's not just because. When you read your Bible, when you spend time alone in prayer, how much are you interacting with other people? None. Not at all. No, that, that's the planting and the watering. It's not about trying to think about Jesus 24-7. It's not about trying to go all day long without sinning. It's not about constantly doing good things surrounded by Bible verses and worship music all the time, which, you know, helps you think about Jesus 24-7. But you ever got angry and yelled at somebody while worship music played in the background? <laughs> oh, how great is he? <laughs> yeah. So here are some keys I want to give you. Part of how we remain in Christ that's kind of counterintuitive but brings you joy. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 20, where two, or more, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So if you're going to hang out with Jesus, gathering with other believers is one way to do that, to experience the presence of Jesus in a very real way. Now, that can be gathered with them for Bible study, for worship, for prayer, for just hanging out, etc. Last night I had a great time hanging out with a guy I hadn't talked to in over 10 years. We were texting back and forth, updating on, on uh, how our lives have been going. And uh, I'll have to share a story about him later, but it was just a, a blessed night of catching up. God has given you a dozen different ways to communicate with people. So what else did Jesus say makes him present with us? One that's always on my mind is from Matthew 25, verses 34 through 36. Jesus said, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Jesus didn't say here, it's like you visited me. It's like you clothed me. It's, no, he said, you fed me. You visited me. Notice that all these things are a personal encounter with a person in the name of Jesus. Notice that all these things are not about doing something great for God or just being used by God. This is about encountering Jesus. And i got to tell you, there's plenty of days where we're like, I'm fried, I can't take any more personal interaction. Or, people are mean, I don't want to talk to them anymore. Or, whatever. Well, that's the part of you 
trying to do things apart from Jesus and it amounting to nothing. Jesus never said, I was hungry and you demanded the government develop a food program. I was thirsty and you pointed out where I could find my own water. I was a stranger and you created an agency to deal with me so you wouldn't have to talk to me. I needed clothes and you demanded the rich be taxed to clothe me. I was sick and you didn't do anything because it's just not your thing. I was in prison and you voted to change prison policy. See, lots of people like to do kind things to help those in need, just don't make me have to talk to them or see them. All those would be problem-solving measures, but they also avoid direct engagement. Yeah, we need to do things to care for the poor, but if we really want to see Jesus, we need to interact with them. The poor, the broken, the hurting. The uh, head of, let's see, there's, there's Compassion International and World Vision, two organizations that function very close to the same where you adopt children and, and help pay for their food, their clothes, their schooling, and, and such. And the, the CEO of World Vision, I was reading a book that he wrote, and I mean, here's a whole ministry globally based on having compassion for people, and he said this, if I don't get out in the field and interact with people, I start to lose focus of what it's all about if, I, if I'm now not out in the field at least every six weeks. And he runs a, a compassionate organization like that. See, there's a different dynamic when you interact with people. Uh, the lead singer for U2, Bono, I saw an interview with him one time, and the interviewer said, you spend a lot of time hanging out with poor people in Africa and Asia. You're a millionaire. You could hang out wherever you want. Why do you go to these places? And he just kind of implied the dirty, smelly, sad places. And Bono's response was, when I read scripture, God is with the poor people, and I want to hang out with God. So I go find the poor. That's abiding with Christ. Coming up with all these programs, it... it doesn't have to do with expressing love for an individual. And something we found in just our interactions with the homeless, even more than food, they're starving for somebody to just acknowledge they're alive and they're cared for. Because what do the rest of us do? A lot of people walk by and they don't have any money to give them or they don't want to give them any money and they feel a certain amount of shame for that so they don't look at them. What's it like if everybody refuses to look at you? In some cultures, that's the death penalty. They don't kill you, they just pretend you don't exist anymore. That's what happens to a lot of these people. They want engagement. That's why our, our God's Feeding Hands group, we don't go out there planning on ending hunger in Stockton, but our sack lunches are a key to opening conversations. Here you go. God loves you and I love you. What's your name? Tell me your story. And they, it blows their mind because nobody else wants to know their name and nobody else wants to know their story. And you know why? Because then your heart might get, be engaged and people don't want to love them. They're afraid it might be too sad. That's an easy example, but it could also be your neighbor. It could also be a coworker. It could be a classmate. It could be that one relative who can't stay out of jail. You know, some people try to start some kind of a program because they're offended that those in need exist. And they're motivated by anger at the situation rather than love for the people. Or they just don't want to have to see them anymore. But see, Jesus wants us to be engaged. He wants us to be eye to eye with other people because he wants you to experience his loving and joyful presence. You don't do these things and God says, oh, okay, that makes you a good person, so now I'll let you in to hang out with me for a while. No. That is the interaction with Jesus when you interact with them. And when it happens, many times you walk away and you know this was about a lot more than just me and him. I, I was sharing with somebody the other day, every time... 
Our CSI group goes to a homicide scene, and I'm just dreading going to that site because of the nature of the neighborhood. I walk away blessed because we encounter Jesus in a very real way. And it used to be, let's go in, we're just going to pray, and we're going to leave. And then one day, there was a homicide at the corner of Church and Hunter, and so we went there. And as we were praying, I saw the street, I Church Hunter, and God just changed my mind. He said, that is your focus now. The church is hunting for Jesus at these sites. And so now, before we go, my prayer is, Jesus, meet us there. And I never know what he's up to. Some days we have this phenomenal encounter. Sometimes it's just all quiet, but we trust that he's done something. You can do that when you go to work. You can do that before you get out of bed in the morning. Jesus, I just want to encounter you. I want to experience your loving and joyful presence. Because if you go on in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, Jesus said this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the chore list. That's the to-do list. Love one another just like Jesus loved us. And I got to tell you, if, if you've had a hard time, you might guard your heart. And you're like, I can't risk my heart hearing anybody else's sad story. Because I don't know if I can take any more sadness. That's like saying, I'm starving, I don't have the energy to go to the grocery store. <laughs> it's where the food is, right? God wants us to engage others. And yeah, if we're trying to do it in our own strength, and our own enthusiasm, it'll amount to nothing. But when we... Uh, Nehemiah, you read Nehemiah, sometimes his prayer for a situation was as he inhaled to answer the king. God, help me with this. Oh, king, here's what I need to do. <laughs> that was the, the extent of his prayer. Sometimes that's all we have time to do. But God wants you to be filled with this joy, and he wants it to happen by your engagement with Jesus through your engagement with those who are hurting. This is not about being clever and, or working hard. It's about loving Jesus and loving people and keeping your eyes open to what is going on around you. Because when you determine to remain in His love, you will naturally bear fruit. One day, uh, Charles Carnahan called me and said, Hey, my principal has a, a rental in Lodi, and new people are coming in, and they like their old fridge. They're bringing it. She needs to get rid of the old fridge. you think we could find somebody who could use a fridge? I said, yeah, let me, let me see. And then me and the boys will grab my truck and come get it. So I called Joyce because she tends to know a lot more people who are in need than anybody else. And she's like, let me make some calls. And she calls back. There's a single mom living on Charter Way with no fridge. A young mom with little kids having to buy milk from the liquor store. How much does that milk oh, cost? Lord. Right? Because she has no fridge at home. And I'm like, awesome. Send me the address. We'll go. So we go to Lodi. We pick up the fridge. <laughs> Speaks to how much the principal trusted Charles. She said, here's my keys. <laughs> <laughs> Charles met me there. We loaded up the fridge. We drove down to Charterway. Pull up to this young woman's place, and she's like, thank you so much. Her dad's there to make sure we're not shady characters abducting her, right? And you could see this overwhelming look in his eye because we are expressing God's love for his daughter. There's no better way to reach somebody than to love their kids. And we offload this fridge, and he says, thank you so much. And he pulls out a $10 bill. It's like all he's got. And I'm thinking, you really don't need to pay me for gas. I said, look, it's not my fridge. It, God is providing it. And I've never seen so much pleading in somebody's eyes 
to take an offering. And that's what I realized. He's expressing his gratitude to God yes. for his provision that day. And so I said, I'll tell you what, why don't I take it and put it in the offering plate on Sunday? And, and the look in his eyes was, that's perfect. Actually, that's what he said. That'd be perfect. Because that is what he was doing. He was expressing his love for Jesus, meeting us there that day. It wasn't about things just working out. When we left, it was a lot more than about, than about us delivering a fridge, and it was a lot more to them about receiving a gift. It was an encounter with Jesus. And we both walked away saying, isn't God awesome in this place? Or I could say, oh, I'm tired. It's going to cost me gas. <laughs> we came away from it energized. Because we were dwelling with Jesus. We were remaining in Him and He was remaining in us. And we were blessed. I don't know if you remember <laughs> from a month or two ago, I was talking about the substance of faith. Like a, a satellite at night that you see go across the sky because the sun rays hit it. Even though you don't see the sun rays, you know they're out there because it hits the satellite and you can see it go by. So the substance of faith, it's a substance out in space. And when we step out in faith, we step into the Father's light. And that is the substance of our faith that reflects His glory to a lost and hurting world. When you engage others in the name of Jesus, you step into the light and reflect the Father's glory. So let me just ask you this. Will you invite Jesus to set you up so that you go about your day-to-day -day business and suddenly you realize, oh, Jesus, you've, you've set this up. You wanted me to run into this person. You wanted this to happen. Will you invite God to bring the presence of Jesus somehow to your situation? You ever prayed that before going to DMV? <laughs> no. Lord, meet me at DMV because God knows I'm going to be there for a while. <laughs> right? I've had amazing conversations about Jesus, not because I'm such a good used car salesman for Jesus. <laughs> the other person was a believer and we felt very blessed talking about how good God has been to us and other people heard because we weren't socially distanced yet. Will you trust what the Holy Spirit prompts you to do? Wow, Lord, do you really want me to tell that person God loves you? They're going to think I'm some sort of a religious nut. If It's not about you always being ready to sell Jesus to somebody. It's about you listening to the Holy Spirit's prompting of you. Will you pray? There was one Sunday I, I called my sermon the most dangerous prayer. Because we were leaving on vacation. We were going to Oregon to go to my nephew's wedding. And we start to leave, and usually we have our prayer as we're heading to the airport. Okay, Lord, watch over us, keep us safe, give us, a, give us traveling mercies, keep us in a gift wrap bubble, right? And suddenly God just prompted me, Lord, we are your followers. We're planning on going to this wedding in Oregon, but you know what? Whatever you want us to do, we are your people. So whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. If you redirect us because somebody needs some saving or something, we make ourselves available. And what, all the things start flashing your mind. What if you miss the wedding? Your family's going to be offended. They'll hate you forever. Blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, God never thought of that. <laughs> you know what wound up happening? We wound up saving the life of Paula's mom. Amen. Because there are no losers in the kingdom of God. It's not God wins and we lose until we go to heaven. It's always win-win. Here's a, something I'm trying to keep in the forefront of my mind now every day. Look for ways to glorify God. Doesn't mean post in scripture notes on post-its all over the store or whatever. It's about church hunter, the church hunting for the presence of Jesus, looking for opportunities to glorify God. You see somebody sitting on the curb crying, go up, hey honey, what's the matter? You might be thinking, you don't have the resources to fix their problem. No, but you know the one who is. And if you're talking to her, you are remaining in Him, and you're going to encounter Jesus in some way. Seek ways to glorify God. Look for opportunities to engage with people with the love of Jesus. In verse 11, Jesus said, I have told you this 
so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. You understand what he's saying there? You're going to like it. You're not going to be upset that you had to do this for Jesus. It's not about you doing your duty. It's about the unspeakable joy of remaining in Christ who is the lover of your soul. So you know what I want to do? I want to invite you to pray a dangerous prayer right about now. And if, if you want to say, yes, Lord, I'm in. I want to remain in you and let you remain in me and see your kingdom come and your will be done wherever I go, just as it is before your throne in heaven. And if you're thinking I'm not cl that clever, then good, you won't get in the way. It'll all be about Jesus. Just like Paul said, when I'm at my weakest, that's when God comes through the strongest. So I want you to close your eyes, and if you want to pray this prayer with me, I just encourage you to repeat these words. Jesus? Okay, we got like three people. Let's try it again. Jesus? Jesus? I invite you to set me up this week. To set me up this week. Show me the opportunities to engage people to engage people eye to eye, eye to eye, or on the phone, or on the phone, and to share your love for them. And to share your love for them. I trust you at your word. I trust you at your word. That it will not be a chore. That it will not be a chore. But will be a joy. But will be a joy. Lord, you've heard our words. Lord, you've heard our words. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person who has prayed this. And Lord, with you, we never fully comprehend what we're getting into. But with you, it's always good. And so Lord, may they be in, standing in line at a store or on the phone with an old friend or something. And Lord, that you will start to be glorified and they'll see it and say, Oh, this is God's setup. He set this up. And Lord, it's not an invitation for us to be clever. It's just our invitation to respond to their need. And Lord, if they have a bigger problem than we could possibly fix, we're going to get excited because it's not about us. But we can introduce them to the one who can fix their problem. And Lord Jesus, drive out every fear that says, but what if Jesus doesn't help them? Lord, you helped everybody in your word that came to you. And we trust that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. But Lord... We thank you for these God-given opportunities to remain in you and for you to remain in us. For us to experience your deep love for us and for those around us. And Lord, it blows our mind that you invite us to be our co-workers in furthering your kingdom around us. Lord, thank you that you don't call us to be experts you call us to surrender our lives in your hands and then watch your glory unfold lord you are the vine all we have to do is not cut ourselves off from you not wander away not refuse to talk not refuse to be around you and so lord thank you that um, when we bless those who curse us when we help the ungrateful and the wicked, your word says then we're being like you because you are kind to the ungrateful and wicked. And so, Lord, out of love and respect for you, we will help others even if they are ungrateful and mean. We'll do it out of respect for you because we want to be with you all the days of our lives. And, Lord, we do it in faith, trusting that you will give us your joy even when we feel like there's no way we're going to feel any joy coming out of this. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers today. Thank you for your promise to never leave us and never forsake us. Thank you for the hope that you give us and the calling that you lead us in. Lord, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.